We have to be like very, you know, on point today, aren't we? Oh yeah, we're going to best behaviour. Best behaviour. Best yeah. behaviour. We've, we've got a whole list of common things not, not, to not, say. not allowed to say. Yeah. That we'll, we'll work our way through them slowly yeah, but surely. Absolutely. So stay tuned. High retention on this one. And that's my favourite thing. Mm -hmm. To get some insight that just is essentially the opposite of what I think as an individual. Yeah. Because that just shows the depth and the nuance that there is in the community. Over the last couple of years, there were days that I second guessed myself and sometimes have like a bit of imposter syndrome as well. But like a bent thumb, which ergonomically is pretty good for like... Is that from Mario? <laughs> they put some more joystick on <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it probably was some yeah, like yeah, yeah. Mario 6 <laughs> Golden Coins originally. Just seized my thumb up. And um, I'm hoping to have a little go on FC24 later. So if we could like wrap this up a bit. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Purple Go podcast. Today we are still in Game Hub, or we are in Game Hub, depending on continuity. And we are joined by Head Honcho, Maestro, founder and spiritual leader, Martin Sibley. <laughs> I've never had that last one attributed, but we'll roll with it. How Thank you? you for having me. A pleasure. Is this your first time in Game Pad? It is, yes. And what do you think? I like it. It's very red. Yeah. I, like, I like the colour ensemble. And um, I'm hoping to have a little go on FC24 later. So if we could like, wrap this up a bit. <laughs> but no, it's cool. It's a really nice space. No, we'll we'll do a nice interlude of FC24 yeah. in a second. Cool. Who's your team? Well, I support Tottenham. Well, so that's going to divide opinion already. <laughs> um, and I've got an ultimate team, which is pretty rubbish, to be honest. But I enjoy playing on it. You're not climbing through the league. Oh, definitely not, I know. No. <laughs> Are you a good player? Uh, I think... I used to be, but the kids have caught up now. Yeah. And by kids, you mean five year olds? Yeah, literally. My nephew can beat me on it. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Like, has gaming always been a part of your life? You yeah, know? big time. Yeah, I had an N64, which I don't know quite date wise on that would be, but it was a long while ago. So I used to like a bit of Goldeneye, but I've always played on the football games mostly. Uh, a bit of Street Fighter back in the day, nice. Mario on the Game Boy back in the day. Yeah. So yeah, I've always loved gaming. I had a, an interlude from sort of going to uni through 20s and early 30s where I didn't game. But the last five years, I've sort of been more home-based, walk at the dog, a bit more time for gaming again. My first game console was a Game Boy. Nice. And I played Mario, six golden coins so much. I remember hearing the gold coin sound when mm. I wasn't playing the game. Yeah, just in your um, sleep. My and parents were like, and about. I think you're playing the game yeah, too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that got like, um, removed for a little while because yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like ding 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 probably actually going insane and one thing I was going to say about the like journey back into gaming from a disability point was with my disability it's progressive so I've got weaker over time and my hands are not as strong as they were like 20 years ago so I struggled to use a controller when I got back into it and then I found this charity and their name is going to elude me right now but we'll look it up um, and they basically have all these ways of adapting the consoles and the controllers, like making it lighter yeah. and like adapting certain buttons to do different functions. So that was quite interesting and sort of evolving through my weakening hand, but still being able to game as well. That kind of transition into sort of doing the adaptive gaming, that kind of inclusive approach, would you like for us to do a sort of campaign specifically around like inclusive gaming. Yeah, that would be cool. It's absolutely, as we know, like it's what Purple Gate stands for around the consumers with disabilities. I basically want to be able to game and go to restaurants and all the other everyday life things. And so when brands have already made considerations and adaptations, brilliant. And there's a lot of that going on, but I don't think it's, it's spread around very well. So there's absolutely an opportunity to do a campaign there. Yeah, I think it's been great. We were speaking with uh, Rach before and obviously having a campaign with Gamepad, with the kind of rig that they've got upstairs, mm -hmm. the accessible sort of setups, and then bringing our influencers here. It's lovely to like find that really natural territory where it's just inclusive content mm -hmm. and they've made an inclusive space and everyone can just enjoy it yeah. and we don't have to like bang the drum and dictate a narrative it just is what it is and it's yeah 
inclusive, fun gaming for everybody. Yeah. Have you ever had to have any adaptions for gaming? Do you manage all right? No. I tend to just kind of play on the normal controllers. Yeah. But then, like, I don't know whether you can see, but I've got, like, a Ben Thumb, which ergonomically is pretty good for, like... Is that from Mario? <laughs> they put some more joystick on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it probably was some, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Mario 6 <laughs> Golden Coins originally just seized my thumb up. Yeah. But, um, but no, it's good. And then, like, in terms of that kind of almost mission-based sort of thing that we're on, that you're on. If you now reflect back a bit of a stock take, we're now at the start of 2024, looking back 2023, maybe before, what do you kind of see as that overarching things that we've achieved in that period of time, both you as Martin and you as Martin, founder of Purple Goat? There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. So I think, as you know, because we spoke a lot, but for the podcast, the disability inclusion stuff spans all all sectors, all areas. So there's always been a governmental, political side of disability inclusion. And I think we're very clear that Purple Goat is very much the, the business case side. It, it's to help brands understand what disabled people need and want as customers, as people. But from that that brand business perspective so i think there's still a lot of other elements around i mean culture kind of goes between both political and business so by media that's a big shaper of culture so i think yeah broad mission is inclusion has a lot of different strands and purple goat is very much that brand part i think the last year both for me and for purple goat has been that almost breaking glass ceiling so when we look back, there's not that many sort of entrepreneur founders with disability. There's not many larger organisations that have this business first approach. So we're really driving a new way, innovating and disrupting. And that means there's no playbook. There's no, there's nothing we can copy and follow it. We've had to figure this out ourselves. And so I think the last year was, we'd already proved the benefit of it for disabled people and for brands. But it's about scale and it's about going bigger and better and really just going into every industry, working with all the different brands. And there's a lot of business considerations behind that. You, you know, if you've got 10, 20, 50, 100 clients, there's a lot going on there in terms of having the right people with the right skill set, being able to support that. So, yeah, I think we know now how to grow and scale the agency. We've got phenomenal people in the agency. And so really it's all there for the taking. But last year, there was a lot of things behind the scenes that we had to figure out, I would say. So as you say, almost getting ready for even more growth, like almost yeah. get the ducks in the road, yeah. ready to grow and scale even further. Yeah, we, so we grew, we grew well last year from the year before. Let's not say we didn't grow, but if we'd have grown loads more, there would have been that foundational element creaking. Whereas now we can grow completely exponentially and we know exactly the right people the right departments the right processes so yeah it's a lot of that business 101 stuff that might sound a bit boring in the podcast but without that if you grow not sustainably there's all sorts of issues that are going to come from that so yeah we've got the confidence to really go after the true potential and then also kind of if you were going to say one thing of 2023 that was either something you're most proud of or something that you've learned the most from? Is there particular things that kind of spring to mind that you're then going to be kind of building on and taking into 2024? And so was that from the business point both, of view? Both, both you as an individual and, and from yeah. the business sense. One thing I was keen to just share with people today, I mentioned that disabled founder, you know, growing up, there wasn't that sort of disabled entrepreneurs. And even from an influencer point, we didn't have social media when I was growing up, first of all, just dating myself now. but. You know, even so the, the last few years, this has been the rise of that representation in media. So the whole point I'm making is about role models. You and I didn't grow up with people doing what we're now doing. And so that's cool that we're doing it. But I definitely at certain points, as I say, without that playbook, have found that really challenging on a personal level. So there's been times where, because there's not that rule book, there's not that exact path that you have to go, and you're just figuring out as you go that there are days you're sort of, is that the right decision? Is this the right direction? So I feel most proud that I feel like really landed, confident, know exactly where we're going and what we're doing. 
Whereas very honestly, over the last couple of years, there are days that I second guess myself and sometimes have like a bit of imposter syndrome as well. So that's my very personal share. And I think from the business perspective, it's similar that we are all much more clear and confident now. And so there's so much to come, but I think I'm proud that we got through those challenges and we got through those days where it was hard and we did have those doubts as well. What do you think it is about you as an individual that has equipped you to be able to navigate those kind of things? When you had those moments where you're like, is this the right decision? Are we doing the right thing? And you got that fork in the road. What is it about Martin as an individual that gets you through and gets you to the other side of whether it's right or wrong, like being able to just keep going and kind of trying different things? Yeah, when, when I, so I said, there's not been many or any disabled founders that I could sort of chat to that were kind of 10 years ahead of where we are and could learn from. But I've always geeked out on entrepreneurship and business biographies and films. And so the, the theory is always, you know, failing is good because you learn and, you know, it's better to, to try than not try. And so there was all those theoretical things. But then when you're the one making the decision and there are consequences if things go wrong, that is a little bit easier said than done. But I tried to embody some of those theoretical business practices. But I think most of all, in reality, it was like whenever you get, it's, it's the little cliches, but when you get knocked down, you get back up again and it's that resilience and... I think also curiosity and self-awareness were big. I just was forever curious as to why things didn't work or how we can try things in a new way. And I think self-awareness was days where I felt a bit burned out or a bit stressed or a bit tired was just to leave it for a day or a couple of days um, and then come back to it. So there's so many elements around self-psychology, around you know culture of business, around culture of social media. But I guess in the end, it is just ultimately not giving up and knowing that, that you will figure it out, even if it takes ages and it's bloody hard. I suppose that's good because in many ways, that's what we chime on to clients about all day, every day is yeah. trusting us, follow the journey, follow the process yeah. and, and actually iterate and develop what they're doing every day. And so if the fact that we're doing it as well, mm -hmm. we're kind of practicing what we preach, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and it's, sort of, it's almost paradoxical and contradictory that you can hold both that, like we talk about clients and that fear of getting it wrong, but still being willing and able to move forward and try things. And I think that's the key is that you're aware of the, the downsides of things, but you still act despite that. I think that balance of both sides of the coin is really important. And then when you kind of do a bit of the stock take, you know, start of the year, start of 2024, what kind of lights the fire in the belly, as it were, apart from a hot curry? Um, what is it that you sort of still relish about what we do and how that fits with your wider missions and aspirations around inclusion? I mean, one thing from the business so it's kind of the business and it it will be very much beneficial to the mission is the goings on with group m and so our sister agency go were acquired by group m just saying that for the people that don't know the backstory and what that really means is that purple goat is becoming more and more part of the mainstream marketing industry so whilst we started out as a very disability specific agency we are in terms of our mission and our services but there's no point us being stuck out to one side as a silo, doing only disability things in complete isolation to all the other agencies and all the other brand plans. So I'm really excited that mostly we're gonna be able to get to talk to even more of the world's biggest brands because of the relationship we've got with, with Goat and Group M. But also that when bigger strategies are going on over how brands are gonna run their marketing, that disability and the broader DEI conversation is brought in earlier, hopefully from the beginning. And so that for me is the big game changer. That, that's just gonna have so many positives to come from that. If someone had said to you four years ago, you're gonna be running the world's first and only inclusive marketing agency that's disability led and is part owned by Group M and is working with brands on a global level, mm -hmm. What do you think that you would say? Shut up. 
Jesus. And then what would be the second thing you said? <laughs> no, really? Shut up. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's actually a great question in terms of timescales. So four years ago today, there was no thought or mention of Purple Goat. We're talking now January 2024. In February 2020 was the first time I spoke to Aaron. I remember I was on a balcony on holiday in Tenerife. Lovely. And when I explained the opportunity in the business case, he was like, we have to do something together. And so from that February to the April, we set the whole thing that's become Purple Goat up in two months. Very like lean startup from a business model perspective, but it's still pretty quick to start a whole new agency in two months. So yeah, to the point the January, I was a decade into still trying to work out how do we get brands to engage more in this. And obviously like similar with government and the other broader mission stuff. So yeah, like to describe it as you just did is very timely and it, it would have seemed impossible four years ago. What would Martin of 2020 and your inclusive mission as a sort of disability advocate, change maker, entrepreneur, what would that Martin think of what you're doing now, do you reckon? Pretty happy, yeah. And, and I think speaking to some of those personal journey I've been on, but I mean, you know, you were like, we spoke every day about it, but a couple of years ago, there was definitely just had a bit of burnout, overdid it, pushed my limits a little bit too much and thankfully got back to me and got back to health. But I think if you'd have only described that, me four years ago, you might have gone, oh, I don't know if I can do this as well. So I think it's lovely to look at the positive outcome that we're in, but I think there's a realism. I and mean, I'm obviously talking very much to my personal journey and I'm gonna flip these questions back on you in a second. <laughs> but I think all of us at Purple Goat have had those days that are quite challenging and quite difficult. And I think it's just really important that we acknowledge and aware of those. It's not all just simple and happy clappy and straightforward. So yeah, that part of it would have scared me, but to know that ultimately we ended up where we are would have been very, very happy. Do you think that there's something to be said for the fact that because obviously what we're doing, ultimately there's a positive mission behind every single client we work with, every campaign we do, which makes obviously our jobs super fulfilling at every turn. But there's also an element of, as you say, like we're breaking the glass ceiling, we're pushing the envelope. And so actually there can be days where you're like, wow, like this has been a full on mm -hmm. energy zapping day. Yeah. How do you kind of balance that sort of personal mission around what we're doing around inclusion with how we're trying to grow an agency, but also trying to upskill the marketing industry in what we're doing? It's kind of very much intertwined, isn't it? And sometimes I personally, you know, definitely forget where that line is yeah. of what I want to do as an individual and what we're trying to do as, a, as an agency. Yeah, I mean, as I have to say, Aaron, of GOAT, I've had very helpful chats with him. I think GOAT has a, a mission in their own way, which is around bringing influencer to marketing. Yeah. So there, there is a mission. I think to your point, when it's disability and a social issue, and we've got a disability and the lived experience, I think we're obviously gonna get more caught up in that because it's very, very personal to us as well. So that bit I've kind of had to figure out in general, but. I think that the general sort of how to keep the business moving, how to work out where I need to put my priorities, but also sometimes when I have to just have a bit of self-care and look after me. Aaron's always been really helpful in trying to work out where those lines are. And I think for all those I mentioned, there, all the books and the, the films I would have watched about entrepreneurship, actually it's not about a one size fits all, one structure. I've probably more learned to trust my own intuition over time. So now I just know when I'm starting to get a bit run down and I can then take the right action. And equally, like when we're looking at, you know, is it for the, for the good of a brand and for the good of disabled people? I think we're more trusting our instincts on it as well. I think if you get in your head too much sometimes, you kind of can't see the wood for the trees. But when you just kind of feel into something, you know if it's good or not good. And that's obviously, as I say, relevant for both brands and for disabled people as well. If you look now ahead to the coming months and year, what do you think is going to kind of change within that conversation? Obviously, you mentioned around we're now sort of in the Group M family, as it were. We're mm -hmm. going to be sort of meeting global brands day in, day out in yep. 
building on where we are right now, but kind of beyond the actual mechanic of what we're doing and where we're doing it, how do you think the conversations we're having, that inclusive narrative, is going to be changing into 2024? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, you look at, I guess, around the time of the pandemic, there was also this big rise around the sensitivity of broader DEI. So I think that that's been really helpful for Purple Goat and for disabled people because there's lots of conversations about race and sexuality and gender and the other DEI strands. That's been a benefit to disability as well. I think, regardless of the specific strand you're speaking to, but that broader DEI catch-all, there's, you know, businesses, and we can all have a conversation rightly or wrongly, but all businesses are set up to make profit. So I'm totally up for conversations in general about is there, like, different ways societally, culturally, all that kind of esoteric, let's sit and have a drink and talk about it. I love all that. But fundamentally, right now, today, the main thing that businesses are trying to do is to make a profit. And so that's why the business case of disability inclusion is important. It doesn't mean that's all we care about for disabled people. There's so many conversations and nuances, but in that initial instance, to be able to meet with these big brands and have positive conversations, there has to be a narrative about the business case. And I think that's what you and I find that a balance because we know there are disabled people struggling for healthcare, struggling for social care. And that's where we talk about the broader mission. But for Purple Goat at the moment, to meet those brands and speak to those brands, there has to be that business case conversation. Then the consequence of actually running the campaigns is that there's representation, society is more aware of issues around disability, then there's more acceptance. And so there is a long tail where all the social side is beneficial but for a brand to spend their money on a marketing campaign, they have to know they're going to make a return on their investment. And I think that's what we've had to get better at explaining, as well as always owning and loving the fact we're making the world better for disability as well. I know that I definitely feel that I'm in the day-to-day talking about the business case more, mm-hmm. and that's not because I feel that brands are like demanding that I say it, mm. but but more because it should be that we can create value for brands because we can. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it doesn't have to be that charitable model, hearts and minds thing to make great content. It's just great content that's going to deliver awesome results for you. Yeah. But just so happens that it's wonderfully inclusive and progressive by nature. And like, that's such a nice sweet spot to be in where we can hand on heart, say, this content's going to perform really well for you, it's going to deliver against your objective, and it happens to do all of that other stuff as well. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate win-win, and we talk about it a lot, but sometimes almost brands don't believe that. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, where's the catch here? We're like, there there really is no catch. You've just got to be brave enough to, like, move the needle a little bit in terms of what you're doing. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there are brands that have taken a stand for social issues, whether that's disability or not, and they've seen that that's made a positive difference with social change and it's had the, the benefit on the business side. But I think if you ask most disabled people, they don't want to be a cause to champion from a brand in the abstract. We just want to be able to, for example, want to stay in a hotel, know that they've listened to and made appropriate adjustments so that hotel room is suitable for us and then have representation of people like you and I in the marketing campaign. So that's where that sweet spot is. It does make the world better and more accessible, but it's not done as this overtly separate cause thing, it's actually doing the work, which is making things better for people. And on a personal level, do you find content that shouts to good things brands are doing around inclusivity, accessibility, do you think that that resonates well with you as an individual? Because you're seeing it and going, oh, right, I can engage with this. Mm. Or do you think that the disabled community are still pessimistic about good work that brands are doing? Yeah, I, I think because of the history, you know, I know there's a lot you can unpack around the medical model, the social model, the charity model, and, you know, even with the business case kind of to your question, I think disabled people are forever cautious and cynical of people 
actually doing it until it's done. So I'm sort of speaking to words are great, but actions are ultimately where it needs to come from. So I think that's where, where it needs to be, is that it's not just fluff. It's actual change around making spaces and places better for all people, you know. And that's the other part we talk about, right? We don't want to put disabled consumers in a silo. It's about brands just being open to all people and having considerations for all different demographics. And you can't argue with it once they've done it, can yeah. you? Like, for example, this gamepad, like, it is an accessible space. Yep. It will allow people to come and game and enjoy it regardless of who they are. Mm -hmm. If you've created a campaign with a diversity of influencers enjoying it and sort of demoing their experience here, that's great and it encourages more people, diverse people, to come and try it out. And that's awesome. And, and for me, like, it's not having to ram that disability narrative down their throat. It's mm -hmm. just, no, this is a great accessible space, but we should be able to talk about that because otherwise, how would individuals know? Because to your point, yeah. there's a lifetime of experience where actually things aren't accessible. Yeah. So it's important for us to shout when things are changing because that ultimately sort of is the war cry to make other people start thinking mm -hmm. in that way and, and start changing the way that they do things too. Yeah, I think that's where we brought in the insights capability and the training and the consultancy at Purple Goat because if you do a marketing campaign but the actual product or service isn't suitable, that's a bit of an own goal. So the first port of call is to check that the product or, and or service is accessible, which you can only do by listening to the disabled community. So that's a big thing from 2023 that we've done really well there. And then once you've done it to your point, we always hear that, oh, we, we put a ramp in, but no one ever came, so we didn't think it was worth it. And you're like, well, did you tell anyone with a disability that you've put a ramp in your building? And they're like, no. So yeah, then you need to shout about it as well. That reminds me of when I went to Belgo's, the muscle restaurant, and they turned their lift into... So the muscle office. restaurant? Yeah. As well. in the food? The, yeah, okay. not, not muscles. To check in? Yeah, I also go to those kind of restaurants. <laughs> yeah, they, they turned the lift into a permanent office. Right. And so I was like, oh, can I use the lift? And I'm like, no, it's our office. Not unless you want to do some data room. For yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And there was just a full desk and a plant and everything in there. Yeah. It's like, brilliant, thanks. And so I had to be literally like carrying through the whole of this restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madness. Mad. If you as Martin, if you think about like Purple Goat as this sort of social media marketing thing that is now going at a million miles an hour, you're cracking that nut, shall we say. Yeah. Are there any other personal passions that you would love to still see change in society? on a very personal level, but I suppose you as an entrepreneur as well. Not giving away all your secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like what areas of society slash your life do you still think there's something that can be done there and I think that there needs to be change? I mean, I made that distinction earlier about business and then the sort of government slash political. There actually is arguably still ways we as Purple Goat can be that conduit between, say, like a political party wanted to really be the party for disabled people. We know that could swing an election if they truly did that. And there's no reason we couldn't help facilitate them understanding the needs of disabled people. So one thing is just that political bit doesn't have to be jarring or separate from what we do at Purple Goat. So I think, yeah, that was one point I just wanted to make. I think most of the things in the world, Purple Goat can and will play a big part by being that conduit of listening, changing, and then communicating. I guess the other part to your question, separate to Purple Goat, is around entrepreneurship and having new inventions and new products and new businesses, whether that be by a disabled founder or doesn't have to be a disabled founder, but the, the outcome of that business is better for disabled people. There's a lot of scope around that. So, I've definitely been pulled into some conversations the last year about how we essentially empower the next generation of disabled entrepreneurs. And it's not only us now, like there are other yeah. people that are entrepreneurial and disabled. We can be those role models to the next generation. And so I guess that's the other part of the puzzle for me. 
I think there's definitely things that have been very rigid for a disabled individual that needs nuance, that needs adaptation. From an entrepreneurial perspective, they've been quite fixed. It's like even something as simple as you need to raise X amount of capital personally and then mm -hmm. throw it into a business. For a disabled person, that becomes a whole minefield when you're dealing in care budgets and all of those yeah. kind of things. Similarly, if you're you know, do the scope of your employment is changing. Like, how does that work with the sort of the unknown of care and, and, and what you need on a day to day level and the mm -hmm. flexibility to know that you can go where you need to go? Are there certain things that you're seeing change in that way, in that like entrepreneurial landscape mm -hmm. that are kind of unblocking for disabled entrepreneurs? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I was going to mention I'm an advisor for Creo, which is partly founded by my disability but it's run by Founders Forum. And that's gonna give disabled founders the more disability specific advice, like how to manage health condition while running a business, which as we've found, you know, can push us to our limits as well. So that's cool. And I've also been in conversations with a venture capital that, you know, invests large amount of money with new businesses as a kind of scout to help because they want to invest more in inclusive startups and obviously therefore disability startups. So yeah, there's some stuff there that's becoming newer, but like the main focus is Purple Go. And if you look at the size of marketing industry, we've barely scratched the surface. So we're going to be busy for a little while yet, I think. So 2024, personal and professional, what are you looking forward to on both sides? What's, what are the big sort of pillars in that year that you're looking forward to? I mean, I, I do think with Purple Go, it is just, getting in front of more brands, winning bigger clients. I mean, I guess there's like a couple of personal passion areas like leisure and travel. So it'd be awesome to work with some yeah, big companies in those sectors on a personal level. Which we are. Which we are as well, yeah. So more of those yeah. as well. But yeah, I think also just that enjoyment of seeing the team grow. And I think because, you know, when, when we started, it was me just trying to go out and sell. And then bit by bit, I mean, you've, come in and smashed it with all the the client lead and the bd and everything but i think it's yeah being able to see other people flourish and grow into their roles is a real thing i enjoy as well so yeah there's a lot there's lots to look forward to and any uh travels for martin this year i i, I was a good debate i would say but personally i'm getting married this year so yeah ding, ding, that's ding, definitely going to be one thing i'm looking forward to yeah. nice yeah. now about to get married in Poland. Yeah. All right. All right. And the stag do, so that can't go anywhere near social media, that one. But yeah, the stag do is coming. If you send enough Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and my, I think because we've said that we're going to have a sort of flip reverse chat on my personal podcast. Yeah. So we'll have a lot more time there to kind of go into like Dom's views of stuff. But I'd love to finish this episode off just couple of thoughts from you on last year and the next year. Similar to you, last year was one of kind of cementing how we grow. Mm -hmm. And I think you're totally right. There are sometimes you're like, is this going to be the quickest way to get where our own goal is? And you don't really know until you're doing it. But it's also having zero fear once you've made that decision of being amenable and adaptable to like to trying it breaking it, then going again and yeah. seeing, seeing what Not went. being scared of failure. Not being scared of failure. And I think yeah, that like, like... Feeling that for true, not not feeling yeah. ethically. And yeah. I think that they're genuinely, there's an excitement in the whole team that everyone knows that we're breaking new ground. And mm -hmm. so therefore there is a, a sense of freedom in the everything we do. We know there's no playbook. Yeah. We know that it can't be measured against something in 2019 because mm. we didn't exist then yeah. and so therefore I love also how I think to your point around the team we're seeing people like craft their own areas of the business and to your point about insights like we're seeing insights flourish to be this thing that we obviously like had a, a vague inkling mm -hmm. that oh insights is like this really valuable thing to really understand how the community think and feel but the reality is and we talk about it with clients all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know everyone in the disabled community yeah. and we can't speak for everyone in the disabled community. So when we go out and throw a survey or you know do interviews or a round table and we get results back that 
isn't what we expected, I absolutely like that's my favourite thing. Mm -hmm. To get some insight that just is essentially the opposite of what I think as an individual, yeah. because that just shows the depth and the nuance that there is in the community. And therefore, we know that at that point, we're not just making assumptions for people. Yeah. We are working with the community and then advising a brand on actually tangibly what is going to work for them and mm -hmm. what's going to benefit because we've actually asked that community. Yeah, when we were speaking about the gaming earlier and the controllers, you know, you haven't needed adaptions, yeah. I have. And then we've got, yeah, we're wheelchair users and there's a similarity. You go into other strands of disability, if you like, you know, sort of visually impaired, hearing impaired, et cetera, et cetera. Like the insights are going to be totally different. Yeah. You and I, as, as empathetic and we've worked in this world for decades almost, we can't speak on behalf of those other sub-communities. So, yeah, I think the insights is a real game-changer for a lot of reasons. And the thing about fear from the client, it takes away the fear because you're like, here is the data. This is what people need and want. Yeah, for sure. And then just to answer your final bit of your question, 2024, I would say, for me, the exciting thing is breaking new ground in terms of the types of campaign that we can do for clients to to show creativity that also is inclusive in a way that people haven't seen before. Like, you know, often we're banging the representation drum and mm -hmm. we're showing awesome content that is diverse by nature, that has nuance in its narrative. Mm. And that is amazing. And it, you know, goes so far, like to the way of what we're wanting to do, but then actually like we want to promote the creativity of the community as well yeah. and what can be achieved through that lens and, and showing through that creative lens, quite often things land maybe in a different way for people. Yeah. So I think from a work perspective, it's, it's definitely that. And personal perspective, you're stag dish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we might not be around after that. Yeah, so, yeah. So. it's been great, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. really enjoyed the PG ride. Until <laughs> April 2024. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah no, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and... Uh, have a lovely rest of your day, Martin. And you too, Dom. Bye. Bye. Bye.